Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 10 of the Odd Sports Topics podcast. We've made it to double digit, boys. I am Michael Rachel uh, with PJ Ellis, as always, and as always, Matt Costa wearing his camouflage. I don't know if you can see him. Matt, are you there? I'm there. I'm here. All right. right. How are you guys doing today? Good. We're We're doing good. All right. So this episode, so obviously we don't have a guest um so no interview for you guys to listen to but you guys get to listen to us with our own opinions on odd sports topics stories that we have written and interviews that we've conducted uh over the last couple of weeks so first we're gonna go over the interview we just had with the play-by-play announcer Corey Riggs PJ I'm gonna kick this one to you because you've known him the longest um what what are you gonna talk about about Corey yeah well uh I think my dad's known him the longest I kind of met him when you did when he uh Corey had us on his show earlier this I think it was in the spring or early summer where he had us on his TV show that he runs down in Springfield, Missouri, uh, and kind of gave us our first exposure. Um, so we, we had Corey on our show this time to, to kind of bring him on and talk about his career, his electric career in broadcasting. He's done um, play by play and color for almost any sport you can think of. Uh, and still to this day does a lot of sports. He does all the Missouri state high school championships. Um, he does Missouri state basketball and football. He does, uh, racing motor racing he does soccer literally anything you can think of Corey does it um so it's just interesting to have him on our show kind of talk about broadcasting we brought up some conversations about hot mics that have been catching some of the most famous broadcasters and um we just had an interesting conversation all around with them so it was was a good time if you haven't listened to it yet definitely go check it out matt uh give us a sales pitch as to why the viewer watching right now should go listen to Corey riggs um i think you should go listen to Corey riggs because he tells some amazing stories that he's seen uh, his oddest moment in sports history or that he's ever seen is, is pretty interesting. It's something that I did not know happened. Um, it's something that as a broadcaster would be super hard to work around and he found a way to do it. Um, definitely go give, give a listen to that. Uh, some of the stuff he talks about uh, working with athletes like Jason Tatum, Dorio Green Beckham, uh, athletes like that, you're, you're going to want to hear that. Those are some big time names that Corey's uh, been, a, been a part of broadcasting uh, games that they participated in. So go, go give him a listen. He's definitely, he's a smart guy. He's a huge part of Missouri athletics and all levels. Um, if you are any sort of Missouri sports team fan or high school, if you went to high school in Missouri, you probably should go listen to this interview with Corey because he's probably been involved in calling a game that your school has participated in. That was pretty good, Matt. I'm very impressed. That was, that was a good sales job. I got I kind of want to go back and watch it, even though I've watched it twice now. Um, also, during the interview, I I say his uh, partner's name wrong three times in a row after being corrected by Corey. Uh, I call him Sean Breeby after Corey told me it was Freeby, and I continue to say Breeby. So my apologies for that one. But Corey was a great interview. I loved how honest he was about the Joe Buck, Troy Aikman thing as well um throw back to sarandon we used to say sarandon's name wrong ah, all of yeah. our, our og viewers our og <laughs> viewers yeah uh, when michael used to butcher sarandon's last name over and over and over again on this podcast so i've never viewers. had something like in my head as i was talking so like i was doing the intro i'd be like hello everyone and welcome like while i was doing that i was just thinking sarandon raboin and every time i'd be like raboin it was so bad i couldn't do it and i felt so bad you afterwards. said like you said like rabin one time and i absolutely <laughs> lost my mind i was like we're like introducing like drew Hayden, and like one of our like our, our great guest of ours and you like butcher her name in the like first 10 seconds of the interview <laughs> yeah I and know. she's like you should see her like her face would just be like like she's like new she's like mm, yeah I don't know what to she do. was a pro about it though she was awesome for she us. was a pro she was a pro she, yeah. she was a great She's Brandon doing well right now. She's out in uh, Arizona doing uh, some studio work, I believe, for the Arizona State's campus. She's doing a bunch of different. Yeah, finishing uh, up her finish up her degree, and then we'll we'll get her full time job. I mean, she's she's great. As yeah. obviously, the work she did for us was incredible, and the work she's doing for them is also incredible. So, yeah, shout out to so, Sarandon. Uh, shout out to Sarandon. Go watch that interview with Corey, though. Everybody, it was very interesting. I grew up always fascinated with play-by-play announcers, whether it be like Kevin Harlan, Mike Breen's Bane, you know, stuff like that. And Corey talked about he had a call that he had growing up that he never uses uh, two hands in the can, which I'm glad I'm glad he isn't using. But but uh, he's got some other cool ones. He he plays he pays homage to a bunch of 
announcers by using their own phrases, which I think is cool. I don't think many announcers kind of do that where they use a bunch of different people. They try to come up with their own. And Corey said that, you know, everyone's trying, you know, to be someone rather than themselves. So go watch that interview. Super, super cool. Let's uh, let's move on to uh, an article that I just wrote about uh, in the NFL and college football with the hash marks. This one was a little bit of interest to, to myself. Um, so obviously in college football, the hash marks are very, very far away from each other. They're 40 feet, the, the two rows going all the way down the field. They're 40 feet away from each other and 60 feet from the sideline. In the NFL, they're way closer together, right? The two rows are only 18 feet, six inches away from each other. And they're 70 feet, nine inches away from the nearest sideline. So that's 21 and a half feet further away from each other in NCAA football than in NFL. And I was just curious. I was like, first of all, why is that? Why is that the case? And then on top of that, like what? What does that help in college or in the NFL? I had no idea. So while researching, the reason for it is actually for the defense. It's it's easier um, to defend in the NFL because the hash marks are closer than it is in college, which kind of surprised me because I would feel like if the hash, if, if you're playing on the left hash and you're only, what did I say, 60 feet from the sideline in the NCAA, you would think you could just like ignore that half of the field and focus on the other one. But uh, Jeff Schwartz, who's a very um, high level analyst right now, he used to play college and professionally. And he was like, no, it's actually harder to disguise pressure in NCAA because if you're burning pressure from the offside of the ball, you have to show that before because there's not a chance that you are sending a guy from the other side of the, side of the field to get the quarterback unless you leave early before the snap. And the other thing is, in college football, I believe the headset does not cut off between the head coach and quarterback. Where in the NFL, the communication cuts off 15 seconds left on the play clock. So when that pressure comes from the other side of the field before in NCAA football, um, the coaches can point that out and help the quarterback out. So uh, the other thing was in the kicking game. Obviously, the, the kickers in college, it seems like it's way harder because you're on the left or right hash and you have to kick diagonally towards the goalpost where in the NFL, the hash marks line up with each upright. So if you kick it dead straight, it'll hit the goalpost. So pretty interesting stuff. Do you guys have anything to add about that? Yeah, it'd be interesting to see, um, translate, see how, like, when you talk about blitzing on that offside blitz, having to show that versus disguise that. It'd be interesting to see if any of these, like, cornerbacks or safeties that uh, blitz from that opposite side, their sacks increase in the NFL just because they, they get a little bit more of that disguise and they get a little bit more of a um, – like closer distance obviously so it'd be interesting to kind of take a look at some of the you know the top corners and top safeties if their sacks increase between their rookie year and their senior year of college or whatever junior year of college or whatever it was just due to the fact that uh that element was surprised so that'd be interesting to look at bad yeah, matt um this was something that was brought to my attention by your article i never really noticed that the hash marks were different before i read this uh now that i think about it yeah you're right i mean they are further apart in college. Um, something I really thought was how this affects kickers, like you were saying, um, how they transition from that, from college to the NFL. I mean, I feel like elite college kickers, kind of like um, Rodrigo, Goggles, Blankenship. I feel like if <laughs> you X, can kick- Dex, uh, Georgia Bulldog. Exactly, yes. If you can kick at an elite level in college, you have to immediately be one of the one of the better NFL kickers just going into the league just because the hash marks get closer. I feel like that would make it so much easier for you. Well, let me let me let me well, kind of go against you on that one. Uh, who was the kicker that he was like a fourth, third or fourth round draft pick in the NFL? Ooh, well, I the, can't uh, remember his name. Florida Not Pinheiro. Guy from Florida State. I can't yeah. remember his either. I thought it was uh, no, it wasn't Pinheiro. No, it's He's not Pinheiro. Pinheiro's in the league. No. Oh man, I can picture him too, and he. He was like the best kicker of all time in college. Yeah. Comes to the NFL and you can't make a kick. That was the yips, though, I feel like. I'll, I'll edit in his name so we don't have to look it up. I'll just edit in his name right it above. Could have, it could have been too, of being drafted that high. Yeah. And all expectations uh, be dynamite. Agayo. Roberto Agayo. Yeah. Agayo. Yeah. Agayo. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so I don't know. Yeah. It, I feel like there's also a lot. Uh, I don't know. At the big schools, there's a lot of pressure in college, so. I don't know. It's interesting. I just, I don't know. I feel like you're still going to have like, obviously, I think, I think it is harder to kick in college. Obviously, if you get to the NFL, like you're still going to have your double doinks like Cody Parquet uh, with the Bears. But you know, I think it's 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 more challenging to kick in college with that. If that's the degree. If you are kicking from that angle like that, um, it's pretty pretty simple when you get to the NFL. Simple. Yeah. When you get to the NFL if it's straight on like that all the time compared to a diagonal thing. I really just wanted to bring up Cody Parquet to make Matt yeah. angry. 
Matt's a Matt's a Bears fan, so we're not allowed to say Cody Parkey's double doink. We've never no. used it in an article or anything like that. We've never no, said it never. on a podcast. Hey, we really hate to bring never. it up to Matt. You know, it's it's like if somebody brought up like the Bucks losing to the Heat in five games, but like we don't do that here either, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, an, yeah. we would never bring that up. No. Never, never. This is, this right. is an anti CP podcast. We don't talk about him. Oh, you don't, don't even say his Cody name. Cody, do you not Cody say Park his name? A friend of, he's a friend of the show. If you want to come on. If you show. want to come on, friend of the show, if you want to come on the pod, you're welcome on the pod. I'd love to have you on the show. It'd be very intriguing to see you and Matt interact. So come on, the show, Cody. Please don't come on the show, CP. I hate to say it, but like, come on, <laughs> Cody. Come on the show. All right, let's talk about how you lost our viewers in the TJ Wings bet of the week last week. <laughs> oh, I forgot that was him as well. <laughs> Cody Barkey, Bear, Browns minus three and a half, needed it for 10% off wins at TJ Wins. In Manchester, Missouri, and uh, how about a did it doink? No, it just missed right, just just completely just missed, missed right. So uh, that, that lost by the hook. So that was fun. So fun fact about that: we we saw the uh, owner of TJ Wings yesterday, and he was convinced that it hit, and we were like, "No, it didn't hit." And he's like, "What do you mean?" And we're like, "They missed the extra point." And he was he he thought it hit this entire thing. He turned off the game after they scored the touchdown. He just assumed <laughs> that he assumed that the extra point went in. He turned off the game after the touchdown to put him up three. Uh, and just assumed that the bet hit. So we informed him that the bet indeed did not hit due to um, an infamous Cody, Cody Parkey. Jeez. Like always. When did you inform him? Yesterday. Oh, so people could have went on Monday, used the <laughs> odd sports topics, Monday. used our <laughs> name on sports stuff. topics, and they could have got 10% off their order. Wow. They they wow. Could've. Wow. Well, hopefully it'll hit this week. Well, or last week. Today. We're releasing it on a Monday. We're recording last Thursday, but this is Monday. Hopefully today you can go to TJ Wayne to get 10% off your order. If his bet hit, go check out the last NFL bets article we wrote to go see what his, his uh, bet was. And if it hit 10% off your order at TJ Wayne's in St. or in Missouri. All right, let's move on guys to some world series talk before we get to Matt's article on the Tampa Bay race team name Tuesday. Controversial to say the least game six, Kevin cash manager of the Tampa Bay Rays pulled their their star pitcher uh blake snell who was absolutely dealing he had two hits and he did not have a run given up it was a one nothing ball game trevor bauer said it had the makings of a game where uh tampa needed to win that game one nothing so pulling blake snell was ridiculous um what did you guys think on the move i'll throw this one to pj first um obviously you you got to keep your stud in there um i think as he was trying to get a little bit too too cute with it, too analytical, trying to think too far ahead. And I think sometimes this simple move is the best move, which is to keep your best player in there. And then I saw, as a Cardinals fan too, I thought I saw like a lot of people talking about how uh, if I was Blake Snell, I would, I would have been throwing a fit, like an absolute fit. Like I was, I was, I saw a bunch of tweets saying I could never imagine Chris Carpenter and Bob Gibson going out willingly. Like they would have absolutely probably fought the manager in, in that in that situation. And, like, I, I get it. Blake Snell's trying to be professional. But, man, oh, man, I can't imagine what emotions that he was trying to keep under wraps there. I, I would kind of like to see him uh, show that, like, that anger and that frustration that he probably felt in that moment. But it, it was obviously not a great move by the, the manager. I, I, I feel bad for him. You know, he wasn't trying to lose the game for them, obviously. So, uh, that move backfired so horribly. And he, he's gotten it so bad from everybody so far. I almost feel sort of bad for the manager. Uh, and also just because I wanted the race to win because I don't like the Dodgers. So. All around, it was it was a tough it was a tough one to watch. Matt, before I come to you, PJ, you talked about what was going through Blake Snell's head, right? And it, it, this is the first thing that came to me. It was an odd thing that I saw. Not really an odd sports topic, but just an odd thing I saw is uh. So obviously he was frustrated, so he threw out an f bomb, right? But we don't we don't we don't air that on you know Fox because you know TV rights and stuff like that. But what they do show is they always show the replay of the guy yelling it, and like there's no mm-hmm. audio, but you can always see the re- they they zoom in on his face and you can just obviously see what he says, which is like, yeah. wh- what's the point of that? <laughs> like, why are we doing that? Yeah. That was just a weird thing that I saw. But Matt, uh, did you? Well, I'm assuming you you disagree with Kevin Cash's decision to to pull Blake Snell, but uh, I'll just let you speak to where you want on this. Uh, yes, I do disagree with that decision. It seemed like Blake Snell, as a Cardinals fan, this is what I'm going to relate it to. It seemed like Blake Snell had a Chris Carpenter complete game, two hit shutout with 11 strikeouts going. And I don't know why they pulled him. I mean, he was dominating. I, I, I think they should have left him in. You can't win a baseball game off just simply, you know, computers. They don't take in that human emotion factor. They don't take in uh, Blake Snell's 
drive, his willingness to want to be in that game and win that game. He'd been pitching lights out. There was no reason to remove him, in my opinion, just one hit. Maybe if this was a regular season game or something and he gave up a hit in the sixth, it's like, okay, yeah, sure. You know, we want to save his arm for later. But you're in the World Series. This is a must-win game six. If you don't win this game, you're done. Go home. I I just – I don't understand it. I don't get it. But it is what it is. Kevin Cash made that decision, and now he's got to live with it. Matt, I have a question for you because you make – as as somebody who knows you pretty well, I feel like you make all of your bets based on analytics. You make all your bets based on data and all that stuff. So I feel like if you're in that moment, you're making that decision. Like, I play you, I play with you in a fantasy football league. All your decisions are based off solely analytics and stats and data. If you make all your bets based on this person who's normally good against this person, his record against all time, and you make all of your decisions based on those moves. And when I try to tell you, no, this team's just clearly better. Like, I watch it with my eyes. You're like, nope, the statistics tell you otherwise. So, I feel like, if you're in that situation, you might be pulling Blake Snell. I'm not pulling Blake Snell in that situation. I don't know. I don't know, I, man. You might look at the analytics and be like, all time against this hitter he's blah 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 and, blah, 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 blah. and you might I'm, pull not, him. I'm not pulling Blake Snell man I'll tell you that for a fact this well, one yeah. this one you're right I do make a lot of my bets analytics you know I put that that last game for example I knew uh Gonsolin the Dodgers starter can't pitch to two hole hitters at all he gave up a home run to Brandon Lowe the first time he pitched in the series so I threw Randy Rosarina first home run what does he do it's a home run first time he comes up because he's a two hole hitter you're right I love statistics and I love that type of stuff but no, I'm not pulling Blake Snell. I'm not doing it. He's well, pitching too good. Lights out. I mean, you got to leave the guy in. But the reason behind it is right. Third, third time up in the order, or what? What's that phrase? Third time up in the order, right? Yeah. Yeah. Third time. Yeah, third, time third, third time through. Time through. Yeah. Third, third time, time through. through. Yeah. And you know, analytics will tell you third time through never ends well for a pitcher, or rarely ends well for pitchers. World Series Game Six. The Rays bullpen's not bad either. I mean, that pitcher no. has been struggling, but the Rays have one of the better bullpens in baseball. They've been. They've been. It, they've been very consistent throughout the year. And we saw Dave Roberts do this with Kershaw, did we not? Uh, he was also dealing in game five. They ended up winning that game. Nobody's talking about Dave Roberts making a similar decision to pulling Kershaw. He got booed. He got booed as during the game. So that was kind of crazy. Um, do you think there's a little bit of a difference between analytics in the regular season and the postseason? Because when I look at the Milwaukee Bucks, they are the most night and day team, day and night team, night and day team from the playoffs and regular season. Everything works analytically in the regular season. Then a playoffs come around and you're going to the series, right? You're playing a team best four out of seven. It's the same team. You, you, they're, they're doing their homework on you. Whereas in the regular season, not as many teams, you know, have, have the ability to do as much research on you. And the Milwaukee Bucks, they're the best team in fast, uh, fast break. We're one of the best teams in fast break. In playoffs, fast break kind of disappears. And it, the game slows down a lot. And teams are able to pick up on your tendencies. Do you think analytics... Uh, whoever wants to answer this, do you think analytics is different from regular season to postseason? Uh, yeah, I think I think so. I think some of the stuff that works in the regular season doesn't necessarily work in the postseason. Um, I think it's difficult once you once you kind of get that familiarity after game three or four. Uh, I think you can start picking up on stuff that you wouldn't usually be able to pick up on in the regular season, uh, considering especially this regular season, especially where the Dodgers and the Rays never played each other. I mean, the Dodgers never played anybody outside of the AL and NL West. Um, so it's hard to scout for a team like that. But after you get that familiarity with each other, I think you can use those tendencies a little bit, but the tendencies from the regular season are a little different. All right. And then before we move on to the article about the team named Tuesdays, the Tampa Bay Rays, Matt, you said you really want to talk about this. So did PJ, but Matt brought it up first. So I'll bring it up. An odd thing in sports is GMs usually do not say they messed up right they kind of go to the grave with oh i didn't have enough time to turn this around or you know oh i didn't inherit this whole team or whatever john mosaic of the st louis cardinals said he messed up matt what was your reaction to that i you know it was kind of refreshing to be honest it was kind of refreshing we all knew it everybody knew he messed up trading or rosarina i mean the guy had the best postseason in mlb history it was his first postseason ever. Um, so I, I think I, I think it was nice to just hear that. It, it was a little bit reassuring that it's like, hey, Mo does know what he's doing a little bit. He knows that he messed up. He knows that, you know, he did the wrong thing. That was nice. But it doesn't take away the fact that he did trade a Rosarino away after not playing him last postseason and starting Bader just about every game. And, you know, we could have used him this year. We totally could have used Randy A. He would have been a huge help in the outfield, a huge help um, 
hitting. Huge help driving in runs, hitting home runs like that. But it is what it is. We got to live and learn. Can't PJ. be hitting all of our bats. Yeah, PJ, do you think it – do, do you say uh, – do you think that was odd to see a, a GM apolo- or say I messed up? Yeah, but I, I think, too, at the same time, I think it's – okay, so I agree. I, I love Randy Rosarina. I think he's a stud. I think he's fun to watch. Um, but I think it's really early right now, too, to say anything. Pitcher we got in return could be a stud. If he's the next Clayton Kershaw, then are we really having this conversation in five years from now? If he comes out and tears it up when a Cy Young in the next five years is really good, and Randy Rosarina comes back down to the average, like let's see him next year after this breakout season. And I love Randy, and I think he's good, and I think he fit every indicator that we have, like his hand speed, his bat speed, like all the analytics say that he's a good player, and that's why it's frustrating the Cardinals didn't see that in their farm system because it's, he's hit at every level. And like all of his intangibles are there, but it's not like we gave him away for a, a, a bag of peanuts. Like Matthew Libertor could be a really, really good pitcher. We just don't know yet. We don't have that information yet. Let's wait and see what Matthew Libertor is. And then let's go back to it. But it is refreshing to see that Mosellock said that, Hey, we missed some things. We should have seen it. We're going to reevaluate how we look at our prospects and go from there. But I'm excited to see Matthew Libertor. Now I'll say this too. He also has a lot of pressure on him now because everybody has seen what Randy's done. So now this kid has to come up and produce or else he knows that they lost the trade. So now he feels probably a lot more pressured to be good, um, which he might not have felt before. But I think I think the pitcher could be really good. He, he was a top pitching prospect. Like he he is supposed to be a very, very good pitcher. So let's see what Matthew Libertor becomes. And not to mention, too, he's best friends with Jack Flaherty. So that's, that might be good for keeping Jack Flaherty around as a Cardinal longer. So I'm just saying, let's, let's see what we have in Matthew Libertor first. But I agree. It definitely hurts to lose Randy A. Uh, and it's good to see that Mazalock admits that they're going to reevaluate how they evaluate their prospects. Some very good points, PJ. While you were talking, I thought some of this responsibility has to go to manager Mike Show, right? Like, Matt, you said he played Bader over Randy A. last year. You know, that's not a GM's decision to do that. Or at least it's not fully a GM's decision about who's playing necessarily. You know, some of the responsibility, in my opinion, has to go to Mike Schilt for playing Bader, who's obviously not even like – like if Bader was benched for Randy Rosarena in the playoffs, I don't think anybody would have been like, what are we doing here? We're trying to lose this series, right? Even with 2020 hindsight, like Bader's not going to move the needle one way or the other. So, I mean, I think a little bit of the responsibility has to go to Mike Schilt as well. All right. Good discussion there, guys. Uh, Matt, quickly, since we spent the whole time on the World Series, you want to briefly go over um, the team name Tuesday of your Tampa Bay Rays, who just lost in game six of the World Series. Yes, um, the Tampa Bay Rays. So they were founded in 1995. First season was 1998. They held a team name contest where their fans could submit stuff to uh, or suggestions to name the team. Shocker. Um, Never seen that before. It was pretty much a ruse. I mean, they wanted to get fans involved, but they kind of had a name in mind the whole time. Um, The owner really wanted to be the Tampa Bay Stingrays, but there was a problem. There was a winter league team in Hawaii that already owned the rights to the Stingrays. And they wanted $30,000 for the name, and the Rays were not going to shell that out. So they decided to go with the Devil Rays, because that is a native species to the Tampa Bay area. Um, So the first couple seasons, I believe it was the first like 10 seasons, the Rays finished last in the AL East every year except one. And that one year that they didn't finish last, they finished second to last. So they needed to kind of rebrand themselves and fix this problem. In 2008, or right before the 2008 season, they dropped Devil from the name and just became the Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, They kind of incorporated the sun uh, with Florida being the sunshine state. They kind of wanted to get away away from the Stingray and turn it into like sun rays. Um, Redid their whole uniforms and everything. Rebranded their logo. Uh, They kept a little Stingray patch on their jersey just to kind of pay homage to their history. Um, but their new logo obviously is like a little sun in the word rays. Um, that year in 2008, they completely flipped the switch. They made it all the way to the world series where they lost to the Philadelphia Phillies. And ever since then, they've made five postseasons, uh, including this one where they went back to the world series again. Um, so it was, it was an interesting story to hear about them and how just all of a sudden they drop devil from their name and they take off, they're gone. So it was, it was cool. Go ahead and give that a read. It's an interesting story. Yeah, that's a, that's a good story. Fun fact about that 2008 Philadelphia Phillies team. They swept the Milwaukee Brewers in the first round in the best three out of five. I was at game three in Milwaukee. They absolutely got destroyed by Philly. But while there, my dad, 
his car was selected on the on the big screen uh they were the racing sausages for those of you who don't know milwaukee there's racing sausages that race in the seventh inning and uh they were dancing around my dad's car and we're like what the hell is going on up on the big screen isn't that your car he won uh free car washes for a year so that was pretty cool wow uh, so a little little consolation prize for getting swept by the phillies all right uh last thing guys matt you also wrote an article um, about the five oddest trades in sports history. PG, I'm coming to you here, though. What is the oddest trade that you can remember and being like, why, what, what? I can't remember whether it was J.J. Redick or Kyle Korver. It was one of those two uh, players. They're very similar, and I mix them up in my head sometimes. Uh, but one of them got traded for a printer back in the day. It was literally like it was like $100, <laughs> and it ended up being like used for a printer. Imagine, imagine being traded for a printer, just how disrespectful I would feel. And then he goes on to have a great career. Like it was traded, he was traded so low for a printer and then he ended up having an amazing career. Both, I, I whichever one it is, had an amazing career. So either one uh, outplayed their printer, their printer <laughs> counterpart. I don't I imagine. know. I don't know. But, Do you have an update on the printer? I don't have an update on the printer. It probably broke down after like three years. Kyle but there could have been some historical before. documents. There could have been some historical documents that came out of that printer. You never know. Like, Never know. like the trade that the trade that finalized for <laughs> Kyle Corver, Jay Shore, for Printer. I really can't right, remember yeah. which one. I gotta look this up. It was, it was that's probably the oddest that I've heard. It was, it was, was Corver. It was Corver. Was it Kyle Corver? Yeah. Yeah. He's still in the league today, I'm pretty sure. So yeah, he's a Milwaukee Buck. It, oh yeah, he is Milwaukee Buck. He is a Milwaukee Buck. For now. He had a good season. He had a good for season now. for you guys this year, right? Uh, I mean, he had a Kyle Corver season where he just, you know, is a liability <laughs> on the defensive end and just chucks threes and hits most of them. So I mean that was in that was in two thousand three. He got traded uh, to the he traded from the Nets to the Sixers for a printer, and that was in two thousand three. He's still in the league now. It's pretty impressive. That is pretty impressive, Matt. What's uh, the oddest trade? And then if you want to bring up a different one from one you wrote in the article, can you bring up one that's really odd in the article as well? Yes. Yeah, so one from the article that I noticed. Uh, one of the oddest trades, the oddest trade, Babe Ruth from the Yankees to or a Babe Ruth from the Red Sox to the Yankees. So on paper, this seems pretty normal. I mean, the Yankees gave the Red Sox $100,000, which back in 1919 when this trade happened, that's a lot of money. Um, here's where it gets a little weird. Instead of dumping all that money back into the baseball team, the Red Sox owner invested all of it into a Broadway play. He made a musical with this money. And then the Red Sox went on to lose for 100 years straight, or almost 100 years straight. They won in 2006. <laughs> But it, it makes you think, like, if he would have invested that back in his team, would they have lost that many years in a row? Would they have won a World Series before that? I personally think so. I mean, $100,000, that could have got you a lot of players. Babe Ruth only wanted 25000 a year. So you could have gotten a couple a couple decent guys to fill in for, you know, what you're missing with Ruth. And to me, I just – I think that's hilarious that instead he, he dumped it into a Broadway musical to try to make money for himself instead of make the team better. Do you know what Broadway musical was, was? Maybe it was like a Hamilton, you know, like it a, was not Hamilton. Was not I can't Hamilton. remember what it was off the top of my head. What if his return on investment from that was even more, though? You know, it might have been. It was, you we'll know, but to, it's first. We'll have to update that. You, you know, I just want to correct you. Though. It was it was 2004. They won the World Series. You said 2006. Yeah, you're right. We won in two because they they swept the yeah, they swept the Cardinals in 2004. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, I. I PJ, I don't know about you, but. Uh, if you look at Matt's ear right now, it looks like he's got an earring on because of the – no, no, turn your head back. Yep. See that little, like, uh, the knob. doorknob? Yeah. yeah. looks like he's yeah. wearing an earring. Kind of funny. A little dangly. <laughs> <laughs> right there. That is funny. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, so that's the one from the article. Do you have another one that you want to bring up? Just you personally? If not, I'll go ahead. Not off the top of my head. I got a couple right. more from the article, but – All right. I've got two then. Um, Chris Paul being denied a trade to Los Angeles. That one – kind of sticks out to me as well just like you know we talk about we fantasy football right pj and you know his uh, league he gets vetoed a lot for a lot of the trades he does so um just vetoing in the in the nba let us the hold on league. let us know in the comment section below if you play fantasy football if you think that you should be able to veto trades left and right for no other reason just because you don't like the trade let me know in the comments below if you think that in fantasy football you should just be vetoing trades left and right or if there needs to be like a, a form of collusion is the other option. All right. So yeah, thank you, PJ, for that uh, much needed hard hitting questionnaire. Um, hey, and then the other one. The fans. We're yes, engaging with yes, the fans here. Yes. Uh, and then the other one was uh, now I've lost my train of thought. This is great. The Doc Rivers. 
The Doc Rivers. Thank you, PJ. Uh, Doc Rivers being traded from Boston to Los Angeles for a first round pick. That one, I didn't even know at the time that you could trade head coaches. So that one was interesting to me. There was a there was a trade that didn't go through. It was Kevin Garnett and Doc Rivers to Los Angeles, the Clippers, for DeAndre Jordan and two first round picks. But that one was not allowed to go through because in the collective bargaining agreement, you cannot trade players' contracts with coaches' contracts. So that's why Doc had to be traded for a pick and not DeAndre Jordan or a player. So those are some of the odd ones um, that I can think of. But yeah, go everybody watch the Corey Riggs interview. PJ, give us a quick uh, update on what's coming out one week from today. Uh, one week from today, you're not going to want to miss this one. We have uh, St. Louis legend and St. Louis Blue alumni. Cam Jansen is going to be on the podcast. Um, Cam brings the energy. He's going to be a lot of fun to have on. He's going to tell some funny stories. Uh, he's probably going to make fun of Matt Costa. Uh, it's going to be a really, really good time just to, to sit down and chat with Cam. He's a great dude um, from Eureka. So St. Louis, from St. Louis, born and raised here, played for the Blues, was a great defenseman for us for many, many years, and you're not going to want to miss that podcast. Absolutely. All right, guys, good discussion today. I thought it was pretty interesting. Hope you guys all enjoyed it as well. Go follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Odd Sports Topics. We've got some interesting content going on there. If you're into TikTok, go uh, follow us on TikTok as well at Odd Sports Topics. And then, of course, our website, oddsportstopics.com. Please be sharing this with all your friends and family and you know anybody you see. We're trying to get the word out. We've got some flyers going around town. We've got some at Mizzou. We've got some at TJ Wins. We've got some at Top Cats. We've got some, I don't know, everywhere. You guys are going around town throwing them to anyone that will listen. So that's awesome. So if you guys could do that as well, you the listeners, and just anybody you see, uh, just mention oddsportstopics.com so that uh, we can start growing a little bit because we love what we're doing and we hope you guys enjoy the content. But anyways, thank you guys so much for uh, listening to this episode. Thanks to Matt and PJ for uh their insights as well. And we will uh, see you guys next week with our interview with Cam Jansen.